So I've been wondering, how hard could it be to design a PCB for a switch mode power supply correctly? Let's find out. For power supply circuits, there are basically two categories, linear and switching. Linear regulators are effectively active resistors that drop down voltage. Switching regulators make use of the energy storage properties of an inductor and capacitor. A transistor switches on and off, while the LNC smooth out the current and voltage to get a regulated output. While that schematic may make the circuit look simple, that switching action causes a ton of design headaches, which, spoilers, you'll see more of in this video. For now, here's my plan. Using this switching regulator, I want to convert DC voltages up to 15 volts down to 5 volts. I chose this part for a couple of reasons. First, at the time of making this video, they were available. And two is the datasheet had application examples of exactly what I planned to do. You might look at this IC's package and think, hey, we can breadboard this circuit, can't we? So first up, let's give that a try. Let's gather up the supplies that we'll need. First is the IC. Then we need some resistors and inductors and a Schottky diode. Oh, and of course, the breadboard. Once you have your supplies, use your arm and sweep them into the trash. Okay, maybe you don't need to throw them away, but you really cannot use or should not use a breadboard to build a switch mode power supply. And if you don't believe me, let's take a look at the data sheet for this part. It says, well, a whole lot of words that mean no. Stick with me because after you see the oscilloscope captures, I think you'll understand why you can't use a breadboard. So for now, let's go with my first real attempt, which is design a PCB with an auto router. Since there is an application of what I want to do in the datasheet, let's use KiCad and recreate that circuit. Well, that was easy. The one major difference is that the datasheet uses through-hole components. In my design, I selected surface mount parts instead. Also, I'm adding test points for oscilloscope probes. In the schematic editor, we can tell KiCad to update PCB, which in this case creates a brand new one using these components. And you know what? Let's just use the default component layout that KiCad provided us. I'm just going to add a board outline and you know what, turn the barrel jack so that it faces towards the board edge. And ta-da, we now have our PCB. Oh, right, traces. Now I'm using KiCad, which doesn't have a built-in auto router, but there is another option. KiCad can export a Spectra DSN file, which other tools can open, such as free routing. This is a GPL Java program, but it gets included with the free version of a software called Layout Editor. Just like KiCad, free routing has a ton of configurable options. In both cases, I'm sticking to the defaults. Let's see what happens. After the auto routing process is done, you export the session file and then import that back into KiCad's PCB editor. And now I can say, ta-da, we have a PCB that is ready for manufacturing. And here it is. Boy, that was fast. Isn't the future great? For all of the board measurements, I'm using the same measurement setup. I have a bench power supply, an electronic load, and an oscilloscope. We did a Workbench Wednesdays episode where I showed how to do this measurement in detail. There's a link in the show notes. Basically, I am connecting the bench power supply to the input, the load to the output, and a couple of scope probes. On the oscilloscope, we have the voltage rail with offset removed and four measurements. The peak to peak, the RMS, and the peak voltage of the output. And to reference what current the load is set to, there is an RMS measurement from a current probe. I got a little bit ahead of myself. When we use a DMM to measure this board, we get five volts on the output. However, when we look at the scope, it's a different story. The peak to peak voltage is over 600 millivolts, which means the five volt rail peaks out at 5.3 volts. So while our average or RMS voltage is 5.012 volts, this board is performing terrible. And for fun, let's see how much current the board can draw before the switcher shuts down. When showing the max current measurement, I have a orange trace turned on, which is the switching node. That lets us see when the regulator is done because we no longer get a good negative pulse. For this board occurred around 3.4 amps. In fairness, this is a peak current, but based on my testing, the regulator struggled to hold three amps for any amount of time. So this example is a little bit unfair because we took a bunch of shortcuts. So let's go do a more proper design and see how well that works out. Do you remember how I got the original schematic from the datasheet? Well, there is a layout recommendation as well. Now I'm using surface mount components, but we can still follow this guideline. Using the same schematic, I created a new PCB file. And this time I arranged the parts in a logical order. 
For example, I rotated the parts so that their terminals faced each other when the nets were the same name. Most importantly, I grouped the stuff on the input and output near each other. Unlike the auto routed board, I also put the test points in logical locations as well. Yeah, I didn't make a big deal about it, but I had to use the KiCad file to figure out where the test points were on the first board because I didn't even bother to put silkscreen, which is a beginner's mistake. Now, next, I wanna show another beginner's mistake. In eCAD software, you can define design rules such as the minimum trace for a net. And I know from experience, a super common thing people do is either leave the default or look at their PCB vendor's minimums and set the traces to that. Even if your vendor says they can do four mils, I recommend starting with something larger like six to eight mils for small signals. And then if you run out of space on the board, you can always make them smaller. Here I am routing the board with six mil traces. You might notice it's actually quite a bit easier now that the parts are in a logical location. And it even goes faster thanks to the magic of video editing. Compared to the last board, this one looks much better and cleaner. And here's how the board performed on the oscilloscope. The peak to peak is over one volt. Um, this is what professionals call bad. It's actually only being measured at 200 milliamps. When I set the load to one amp, the scope couldn't even measure any of the voltages. So what's going on? I hesitated to show this actual board because it kind of implies the auto router board performed better. But there's a lot of things that are happening here and they're more than what I can explain in this video. But take a look at this signal. This is the switching node connected to the inductor and it is ringing like crazy because of the impedance of these traces. This ringing is the reason we cannot use a breadboard for switch mode circuits. The transistor, capacitor, and inductor are just too reactive. With these first two board designs, we basically made breadboard versions of our circuit. With one simple trick, we can make this board work much better. With the exception of the through holes and the logos, we removed all of the copper on the back of these boards. Whenever you do a design with high speed switching, it is always a good idea to have a ground plane. In the case of a two layer board, we can make the bottom layer a fill attached to the ground node. And that is the only change I'm going to make from the previous board design. The ground on the bottom layer attaches to the ground on the top layer with a few of the through hole connections. On the scope, look at the incredible improvement the peak to peak noise is down to less than 240 millivolts and the max voltage is less than 5.25 volts. And the best part is this board costs the same to make as the other board. Remember PCB fabs do not charge by the amount of copper you use. I think if we used larger traces and put a few more ground vias on here, we could get better performance out of this board. But for the best performance, we don't need to use a trace at all. Before we go back to KiCad, let's take one more look at the datasheet. Their recommended layout does not have any traces. They just have these big blobs of copper. That's what some engineers would call a hint. So let's do the same thing with our design. Wherever possible, we can use a zone or pore to connect related nodes together. Taking the time earlier to lay out the components in a logical manner really helps in this case. These zones allow for a large amount of current to flow and the ground loop from the top to the bottom is extremely small. Now, a few traces like the feedback nodes don't really need to be a pore because there isn't much current going through those, so they're less critical. A trade-off with doing planes like this is that if they're not well coupled to the ground plane, they can become sources of EMI. But in a power supply design with a clean ground pour under the components on any layer, this is going to be fine. How fine? Let's go look at the scope. Here the regulator is drawing one amp and check out its peak to peak voltage. 22 millivolts. Keep in mind up until now, our best case was 10 times bigger than that. When trying to max out the current, initially this board failed at 3.5 amps, but then I was able to slowly push it up to four amps. Unlike the other designs, this one could comfortably run at three to 3.5 amps with no heat sink, just fine. And I know somebody's going to ask, why not put a heat sink on the TO220 and see how well it does? Well, with a thermal camera, we can see the IC is definitely getting hot, but looking overhead, the inductor is just as hot as the IC. So I could try finding a lower loss inductor and then put a heat sink on the TO220, 
but I think this video shows that just by using proper ground pours for the layout, we can vastly improve the performance of a switch mode power converter. Also, don't trust your DMM. So how hard is it to design a power supply PCB with copper zones and a ground pour? I think it's pretty easy. But why don't you head over to the Element 14 community and let me know how hard you think it is. While you're there, if you have PCB questions, feel free to ask them. Also, I'll post the KiCad 5 design files that I used for these boards over there. That way you can practice laying out the zones yourself. For now, thank you for watching.